Welcome to the Wall Street Lab podcast, where we interview top financial professionals and deconstruct their practices to give you an insider look into the world of finance. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Wall Street Lab podcast. Today, we have for you Michael O'Sullivan. Michael is the author of The Leveling, What's Next After Globalization. He is a World Economic Forum Global Futures Council member and Forbes contributor. Michael holds a PhD from Oxford and is the former Chief Investment Officer for International Wealth Management of Credit Suisse. We talk a lot about his different roles, like being an equity strategist and of course his work as a CIO for Credit Suisse. We talk about education and Michael lets us in on his career advice, what it takes to succeed in finance and the skills a CIO needs. We then jump into Michael's book, The Leveling, and speak about economics, the impact of globalization, the global financial crisis, and many more interesting topics. One short message before we start the interview. We sometimes had some noise from the connection, so I'm really sorry for that. I still hope you... Nonetheless, enjoy the episode and get as much out of it as I did. And of course, if you like this episode, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from. And now, without further ado, our interview with Michael O'Sullivan. Hi, Mike. It's a pleasure to have you on the Wall Street Lab podcast. So happy to have you here. Hi, Andreas. Thanks a million for having me. It's a very interesting podcast. I'm delighted to contribute. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to see a bit about the economics. You also wrote a book at which I want to dive in deeper. But why don't we start off with you telling our young listeners out there, what are you doing and how did you end up in finance? Good question. Somewhat kind of by curiosity, somewhat by accident. So I grew up in Ireland, went to university in Cork and did a degree in commerce and business. And the parts I liked really were finance and math and just trying to interrogate the rules and the workings of markets. And then after that, I went to Oxford to do a master's and PhD or DPhil in finance, focusing more on kind of corporate finance and corporate governance. So I've always been interested in all the aspects of markets, not just the price aspects, the behavior of markets, but also the rules, the regulations around them and the kind of the, how would I say, the microstructure of markets. And I've always had, I think, a general curiosity for how economics, politics all stick together, either going back through history or into the future. And when I was doing my postgrad, I just happened, and you know, many people's careers sort of happened by accident. I met someone who came to give a talk and he was working as a market strategist at one of the big investment banks. And I went and did an internship for him. I kind of liked that. That gave me a sense of what it was like to work in banking. And then when I finished my PhD, I went teaching in the States for a year or so at Princeton in the US, which was a great experience because The faculty who were around me were absolutely inspiring. They're really, you know, the very top quality people. So you just got a sense for sort of sitting at their feet and hearing some of the great minds. It also, I think, gave me a sense that I wanted to do something maybe more applied. And I, because of that, came back to Europe. So my first kind of job in finance was at UBS in the investment bank working in equity strategy. And then since then, I've sort of been in that line of work, equity strategy in a couple of banks, and then moving to Credit Suisse to the buy side, where the last five or six years, I've been the chief investment officer in the wealth management division. In between that, I've held other roles, head of thematic research, been running the Research Institute. So I've kind of enjoyed and I've been given the freedom to pursue the line between investing, research, and thought leadership. That sounds really amazing. There's a lot of big names in that CV. Can you tell us a bit more about what is your role as equity strategist and how does it differ from a chief investment officer? So I think the difference would be, I suppose, equity strategist. You know, people tend to go into maybe two broad streams in markets. One is debt, the other is equities. And they, they have slightly different kinds of anthropology or sociology. 
And I think they attract different people and people behave slightly differently within them. And they pay attention to different kinds of information. The fixed income people are more focused, I think, on macro, whereas the equity people are and should be more focused on what's happening with companies. And I would say the equity strategy part is just one component of the role of chief investment officer. Investment officer should really encompass the idea of a portfolio, should encompass the idea of looking across asset classes and also trying to fit all the working parts and markets together, what central banks are doing, maybe what's happening in politics, how does the behavior of currencies affect the portfolio, etc. So the chief investment officer one is probably more holistic. The equity strategy one is more specialized and you probably have people focusing more on things like sectors, investment styles, country selection models, that kind of thing, and being more attuned to what's happening within companies. A equity strategy sounds more on a micro factor, but what you described as a chief investment officer seems more like a macro factor. Is it then common that more like a debt strategy, like a credit strategist would have the natural role to go it as into chief investment officer or would you say it really doesn't matter as long as you have the skills to get from micro to macro i think you're right i think it shouldn't exclusively be equity or credits strategy i think once you can demonstrate an ability to sort of synthesize what's happening within markets the macro and be aware also of what kind of products are deployed to play these and then how they fit into and how they result in a, a strategy within client portfolios Those are the kind of things you need to look for. Okay, would you say the skills you needed as a chief investment for also as an equity strategist, was it teached in Oxford or did you acquire them by teaching yourself in Princeton or do you think it was more something you learned on the job? That's a good question. So as far as I know, there's no chief investment officer course at Oxford, any other university. But it's a good question because I think you only realize when you get to a sort of later stage in your career, you only realize that things you've been taught maybe 20 years before are actually interesting and also, I think, useful. And I think one thing that I found useful, I think in, in Oxford at least, they teach you to sort of think on your feet and to communicate And I found that as a skill to be quite useful. But in general, I think you only ever get to the CIO or, or other level when, you know, by virtue of the experience you accumulate within an institution or other institutions, you've kind of got to prove yourself in the equity strategy or other roles first, and then you find your way to a different role. So I suppose my advice is that, you know, people will at university or in different jobs and roles, they will learn things that you know, maybe they think won't be immediately useful, but it will sort of come back to support and help them later on in their lives and careers. Absolutely. What kind of skills that you mentioned would you recommend people to try to learn to get into an economist role? So I think, I mean, let's say if I was going to interview someone, the thing I would look for most is just a sense of passion. You sort of assume that people are clever, that they can do all the kind of the technical stuff in terms of the analysis. But what I look for is a passion and a curiosity. And I've often interviewed people in the past for jobs and I felt, hmm, you know, maybe they should actually be in a different industry. And, you know, unsurprisingly, one or two cases I've heard that they've gone to other industries where maybe their passion lay. So. And I think in banking and finance, people work very long hours. It's a challenging environment. So you really need to love the job and you, your mind needs to be turned on by it. So for me, that's probably the most important thing, you know, besides the basic technical skills. What does fascinate you so much about finance? Why do you love it and what keeps you in the game? That's a good question. I actually find it hard to... For me, it's the complexity. It's also... I think the way you have maybe four or five different topics are all welded together. So there's the law, there's economics, there's history, politics, mathematics. They all, every day and every minute, they come to joust in markets and provide a background and a kind of fabric against which people are challenging ideas. So if you would describe the role of chief investment officer, you said you challenge ideas, there's many things coming together, 
what are the daily tasks of a CIO? Is it more you react to kind of the markets and then you try to make sense of them? Or is it rather proactive and you're trying to figure out based on different models what is going to be the next move or anything the like? I think the ultimate goal, I suppose, is performance and generating strategies and portfolios that will perform and, and make money for clients. That's the ultimate thing on, upon which you are gauged. You can have lots of good ideas and be a very good communicator, but I think if the if the performance is not there, then you, your lifespan is pretty short. So I think the crux of it really is performance, finding strategies and also the products and ways of implementation that will actually generate performance. And I would personally put a, a strong emphasis on absolute performance rather than relative. It's no comfort for someone to say that, you know, you've kind of beaten the opposition, but you're still down by 10% in absolute terms. So I think a focus on, abs on consistent absolute returns for me is probably the number one thing. And then trying to get a sense of kind of, you know, broad macro and market trends on a three to six month basis is probably the important component within that. And, you know, and then having a sort of a sense and a philosophy as to how markets are behaving, how the big asset classes are correlating with each other, what's happening at the margin in terms of the second derivative of where you know, market prices are going. I think underlying all this for me, the really key issue or metric is the whole idea of risk appetite across markets and where that is and being able to measure it. And the way markets are at the moment with central banks being so prevalent and dominant, that really is key in terms of where or how portfolios tend to perform. You had a very interesting point there on central banks being dominant. I want to dive into that in just a moment because you also mentioned that in your book. But before that, let me just ask another question that we had some guests on the podcast They say, and I think it's common research that the returns of a portfolio are largely correlated to asset allocation. So do you agree with that or would you say asset allocation or switching the asset allocation due to economic changes is very important? Or would you say there's a difference between maybe strategic asset allocation long-term and tactic asset allocation? And which is the one that you would focus on? So the one I would probably focus on is the tactical. And I think we're kind of coming up to a point in markets where people need to really evaluate the whole strategic asset allocation because you know in many markets, returns have been very strong. Valuations are getting to historically high levels. Central banks have helped to push them there. And that won't continue. So I think people need to rethink the whole debate on strategic asset allocation. And then at the margin, that makes the tactical aspect even more important. So I think we're probably coming to maybe to a turning point in that whole debate. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Now I would like to jump into what you mentioned briefly, the central banks are being so dominant. Now you've wrote the book, The Leveling. Can you... Give us a quick overview on what you talk about in the book and then maybe jump into what you described as the role of central banks within the global financial system. Oh, well, of course. So the leveling is really all about the end of globalization, what comes after it. And for the last 30 years, and I guess many people listening to the podcast will have just lived through that period exclusively Globalization has been the driving factor of so many things, country, performance, companies, technology, and that all is coming to an end. I mean, you can just, if you measure it, look at trade flows, etc. it's coming to an end. The behavior of the American president, Brexit, other events are sort of hastening its demise. And the book is less about kind of being gloomy about all this and the world coming crumbling down, but it's more about what are the hurdles that need to be surmounted in order that the next maybe 30 years is more constructive. And those hurdles are in the areas of politics, economics, geopolitics, for example. You mentioned central banks. One that I've focused on is the role of central banks, because if we go back to, say, the 80s or 90s, they had a very defined place in the political economy. And a very discreet role in the sense that, you know, they had their job, 
the underlying economic climate was very, very different. We had inflation, which we don't have now. We probably had slightly bouncier or higher growth in many countries. You know, emerging markets were just beginning to perform and growth today is much more troubled. And I think what central banks have done in the last 10 years as a result of the global financial crisis is that they have become the players across politics, markets, etc. The first wave of QE effectively helped to mend the global financial crisis, but they've continued with that for nearly nine or 10 years. And I think that's too much. And it's a bit like a doctor, you know, someone comes to a doctor with a broken leg or they've got a heart attack or cancer and the doctor might give them morphine but the doctor will only do that for the first couple of days to kill the pain they won't do it for nine years and that that's as an analogy what i feel central banks have done is that every day they've been giving kind of sugar to investors or they've been giving morphine to the markets it completely distorted the behavior of markets fixed income markets were now into negative yield territory for 20% of bonds. It's also providing the cover for politicians to do silly things, be it in Italy or the States or elsewhere, because you don't have that kind of vigilante or disciplinary effect from markets on politics. So my point here is that central banks have initially helped end the crisis, but they have become too dominant and they effectively covered up lots of underlying economic problems and central banks now need to step back. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. You also made a point on that quantitative easing, the role of central banks basically leaves fiscal policy that what the politicians can really do to be of very little use nowadays because or they it's all the powder is dry if we have another recession then there's no powder left to help out can you maybe elaborate a bit on your idea on that yeah exactly so in a way i'm not keen to blame central banks because central bankers as individuals are generally quite progressive people And they haven't been doing this for the wrong reasons as such. And they've responded, for example, to the financial crisis, which was largely caused by the banking community. But I think what they've done and the persistence of their policies has had a number of effects. One is that governments and companies and and particularly emerging governments have taken on much more debt. World debt levels now are the highest they've been since the Second World War and going beyond that to the Napoleonic Wars. The second thing is that there's been very little urgency for politicians to address underlying problems, one of which is productivity. Another one, for example, you know, you have all of these structural issues across the Eurozone and they haven't really been addressed because the QE provided by the European Central Bank has dampened bond deals and it's made it much less pressing that the Commission, the EU, would need to, to uh, you know, address the underlying structure of the Eurozone crisis. So now we're at a situation where, you know, if you look at the US as an example, you know, debt levels are extremely high, historically extremely high. The fiscal deficit is very, very big compared to history. And arguably, if you hadn't had QE, the market would have disciplined the government much more and we wouldn't be in that situation. So as as we now maybe are on the verge of another recession, there's very little, as you say, dry powder to soften that blow. Countries like Germany, for example, have that capacity and may need to use it in coming years. What would happen in your opinion if there's another recession? So I think it depends on the flavor of that recession, if you like. And I think the next recession will probably be deeper in the US and China than it would be in Europe, because Europe has had a lot of leverage squeezed out of it already. And the risks really in the US and China are trade related. They are also related to indebtedness. And also, I think in China, it's interesting because, you know, they haven't had a a recession and sort of even going back beyond the last dip. They haven't had a real recession in maybe 20 years, effectively. And as a result of that, there's lots of inefficient capacity that's been stored up. And that will only come to the surface when you do get a sort of proper clearing out or a proper recession. And that will produce lots of social effects. So unemployment in China has generally been very low. If there is a recession, 
you may get a spike in joblessness, which I think would be a politically very difficult issue for them to deal with. Now, we've, we've talked a lot about how central banks' actions affect politics. Now, I have a question going the other way around. Is it more prevailing that now politics has a bigger role in financial markets? Because I think that there's been a saying more or less that politics have a very low, very short shadow in the markets. So that means they might be a dip, there might be even Trump being elected is like one or two weeks of a bit volatility and then afterwards, but long term, it doesn't have a real effect. Would you say things have changed? They're beginning to change. So, you know, any academic or strategist looking at this will probably be able to measure the effect of politics across markets. And I think you derive at the conclusion that it doesn't really matter an awful lot, or most of the time it doesn't really matter. You know, it's things like, as I said, the central banks, earnings, etc., that tend to be more telling. But I think Politics and geopolitics is beginning to matter more for a couple of reasons. One is that the sort of the political, financial, fiscal situation is more precarious, as I've mentioned. Secondly, you have more politicians who are behaving in a bad and unpredictable way, be it Brexit, Trump, Italy, some emerging markets like Turkey, for example. And certainly in emerging markets, the political risk aspect has always been very, very high. It's been much lower in the developed world because you've had stronger institutions and politicians have generally tended to be on the kind of better behaved and maybe more dull side. And that's changing now. And then looking into the future, there is the beginnings, and I kind of cover this in the book, there's the beginnings now of a political backlash where... You know, if you look at the starting point, so if you look at our starting point today, the distance between profits as a share of GDP in the States and wages as a share of GDP in the States is massive. Or if you look at the ratio of one week's wage to the value of the S&P, it's the highest or lowest, whichever way you measure it, that it's ever been. And there is a backlash now against finance, against companies that is beginning to build. And if you look at the democratic candidates in the US. I mean, the prominent ones of the top three, you've got Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, who are relative to US politics, pursuing very left-wing kind of stance. And I can see that happening in other countries as well. So the political backlash, I think, is against markets and against companies in that sense is just beginning and will become, I think, a much greater force in the future. Yeah, you touched on the topic of future. How do you think this political backlash or also this backlash against the banking system, the financial system, will change the banking system of the future? Or how does the banking system have to change? You mentioned in your book some statements, for example, that banks need to communicate more simply or that they have a very large impact on the stock market, on the real economy? How would banks need to set themselves up to succeed in the coming world? So I think, to be honest, your banks have been heavily regulated in terms of the regulatory pressure on their balance sheets, almost to the extent that that's been too severe. I think other parts of banking have not been tackled by regulators. So in some countries, Germany, if you look at Deutsche Bank, you know, there are some serious issues on its balance sheet that haven't really been addressed head on. So there are things that have been accomplished and others that have not. Also, I think the new banking system in Europe, you know, you've got many fintech companies, arguably regulation has been too light. And many of these companies who should be taking the strain from the bigger banks are not because they still have issues with money laundering or suspect financial flows, which I think regulators have not yet gotten a grip with. I also think that for banks, there are one really sizable macro issue is the whole interest rate environment. So negative rates tend to be, negative and low rates tend to be bad for banks because it makes it very hard for banks to be profitable. So that's a, a long-term concern. Another one I think that people don't focus on a lot is technology. In some respects, many banks are just sort of tech companies in disguise in the sense that they spend about, you know, maybe half of their revenue and their budgets on IT. 
so they're huge centers of IT spend and IT expertise. And in some cases, the expertise is not there. That also goes to show that their potential competitors in the future are and will be the likes of you know the big tech companies and other tech entrepreneurs. So they're facing attack from different quarters. I love your view on the different competitors that are going to pop up. How much of a competitor do you see fintech companies? Do you think once they get regulated, they will crumble under the emerging pressure from regulators because they don't have the infrastructure like a bank to set up the proper regulation? Or do you think because they are faster, they don't have legacy infrastructure, they might be better to adopt and maybe take some share of the big banks? It's a very interesting question because I've seen quite a lot of fintech companies who are very tech heavy. Their biggest failing, if that is a failing, is just to understand how the banking and investment world works. And very often they come up with very clever tech solutions that look very efficient, very logical, but maybe don't quite recognize how things are done or how people behave. And as a result, they don't succeed. So I think there is a space. The challenge really is for banks to be able to get IT to work for them in a sort of cheap and efficient way, or it's for IT and tech companies to really understand banking and apply tech to it rather than trying to, to reinvent whole processes. And there are so far few who have managed to do that, I think. I think a lot of the big banks, for example, are still struggling with legacy tech in that they're just building upon layer upon layer of technology processes, which I think as time goes on, prove to be slow and inefficient. Yeah, absolutely. I see the same thing happening with many banks. They struggle with the legacy IT infrastructure, but of course they kind of need it to support their daily business. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit and jump back into the economics part. You have a very interesting theory on multipolarity that you express in your book. Can you tell our listeners a bit what is the concept and why do you think it will apply in the future? Okay, thanks for segueing into this because this is interesting. So the world of the last 30 years has been described by globalization. And what that means is that everything is interconnected. It's interdependent. It's like a big ball of string. And if you just think about the world, you know, we've people internationally have bought the same global products. You've had a flow of ideas, a flow of money around the world. And in recent years, a lot of those kind of fluid trends have been disrupted and halted. Financial flows, in many cases, have been disrupted by the financial crisis. And we're now evolving from this world that has been hyper-connected to one that is multipolar. And what I mean by that is that it's a world that is increasingly driven by the idea of three large regions, um, at least three large regions, the US, China, Centric Asia, and Europe. You might even add India plus Dubai to that as a fourth one. And in that respect, the world will become more regionalized because these big blocks, they're, they're big and they're economically powerful. But for me, the interesting thing is that they are increasingly distinctive so let me give you an example. So in the last maybe 20 years or so, the internet has developed in a global or international way, but it's becoming increasingly fragmented. So in China, you can't use your Gmail account. You know, the Chinese block off their internet. In the US, the debate is how do we accommodate these huge, big internet companies? Europe doesn't have those internet companies, but is in the lead of regulating the internet and setting up the rules around the interaction of these big internet companies and their users and what happens to their data. And we see the same thing happening, I think, in politics, also economically, you've got different economic models. And, you know, for example, now in Europe, I think there is a slow realization at the part of the European Commission that it now faces at least two strategic competitors in the sense of the US and China. And I see this reinforced every day, both in the behavior of companies, of politicians, and increasingly of consumers who tend now to be a little bit more home-focused or even nationalistic in terms of how they are beginning to consume. I fully agree with, with that thinking. Now I came to mind a book that I read called AI Superpowers by Kai Furi. I'm not sure if you've read the book. It's a great book, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And I would like your opinion on, because he's basically saying because Europe is regulating the markets or GDPR financial data or like data of people so heavily that they going to get behind in the race of technology. What's your stance on that? I think he also makes, you know, Europe is already behind in the sense of entrepreneurship and being able to create big tech companies. That's clear. I don't think that's a reason for Europe to be behind in regulating it because I think what Europe is doing in terms of protecting data and consumers is actually quite progressive and will, I think, be seen to be the right way forward. And this is also an open space in terms of regulation. So the first region that really jumps into this will be the one that sets the infrastructure. He also makes the point in his book on AI that one of the reasons that China is so good at AI is not because of its technological prowess, but because it has so much data and but and because the authorities and the tech companies, be it Weibo, et cetera, in China, who have been allowed to collect so much data on ordinary people, be it about their social, political, economic habits. And it's just the ability they have to harvest, process, and test all this data gives them the prowess in artificial intelligence. I think this is a good segue into another technology topic that is closely related to data. And I would love to hear your opinion on cryptocurrencies and blockchain, where you, for example, could maybe bring the regulation of keeping private data private and making it available at the same time for companies or for governments to use it. So I think the blockchain space is very interesting in that it provides a structure by which you can kind of section data and restrict private data to within certain circles of users, for example, between a patient and his or her doctor and perhaps their pharmacist, whilst restricting it to other users. So I think that that would be one aspect of blockchain that I think will prove incredibly powerful. I think if blockchain lives up to its promise, and it's just beginning to get used now across industries, it is something I think that can help to cut costs and to rationalize businesses. And maybe we'll have the effect on business processes that, for example, the shale and fracking industry had on the overall oil sector. I think Bitcoin, which in part relies on blockchain technology, is a completely different area. And I see them as being very distinct. And I think Bitcoin and the other so-called cryptocurrencies have so far effectively failed as currencies. They're not currencies in the sense we would accept, in the sense that we would transact in currencies. They're not really used in a retail sense. And they, to a large extent, are just either speculative assets or they are means of transfer within certain communities. You know, I'm told that the biggest holder of Bitcoin is the FBI. It'll give you a, uh, a sense as to who those communities are. <laughs> Interesting. So for me, that's really a, an area that has really yet to prove itself as a sort of a quality part of economics. Do you think Bitcoin, blockchain, whatever cryptocurrency have the potential to be part of, say, an investor's portfolio? So background is we had a guest recently and he basically said he encourages his investors to invest a very, very small portion into upcoming cryptocurrencies because he believes that it's basically like hedge funds 20, 30 years ago where they're really uncommon in an institutional or high wealth portfolio, but nowadays are very common. And he sees maybe cryptocurrencies have the same potential in the future. I don't think so because they are not really backed by any economic activity in the same way that, say, a company would be. And they pose lots of risks. So first of all, in the area, there's huge amounts of fraud and huge amounts of kind of fraudulent coin issues. Then the second issue is actually the infrastructure around or with which you would hold these coins is not safe. So you have a lot of hacking of exchanges and the like. And then the third issue, I think, is from a kind of a strategy point of view, even some of the cleverest people I know in markets don't really understand what 
Bitcoin or the coins are in terms of how they actually how they behave and what they are. You know, do they behave in line with other currencies or with broad risk appetite? There's a big question mark there. Yeah, it makes absolute sense to me. Now, I want to be respectful of your time, so I just want to ask like one or two questions, maybe. And the first one were a bit on a personal career advice level. Would you say that your role as a CIO equity strategist set you up in a way to get all those ideas to form into a book? Or how did you decide to, okay, I need to write a book about this? That's a good question. It certainly helped because it sort of exposed me to lots of different influences. And I think if I, for example, I had stayed as an academic and tried to write a book like I did in a kind of a closed room, it wouldn't have been the same and it wouldn't have been as enjoyable. So I think the virtue really was just having an environment where, you know, things were always being tested out and also I think where you can see the interconnection of things that really helped a lot. Perfect. Yeah, I think it absolutely makes sense. Well, from what you describe on your job versus what you describe in your book, it's actually very, very similar concepts. Now, as a last question, maybe, do you have any advice for people that want to get into a financial economist, also in your case, about wanting to become an author of a book? Maybe you have some very special insights on that. Okay, so they're very different things. I think if you to take the second question first, I think if you want to be an author, you know, it's a tough process. <laughs> and I think you need to spend some time getting your writing style up to a standard, but also a style that you're comfortable with. So one of the things I've done for the last five or six years is I write a weekly blog. It's called the leveling blog now. but And that's just, say, seven, eight hundred words that comes out on a Sunday morning. And It's sort of freestyle in the sense that I kind of bring together personal experience with ideas, with what's happening in markets, etc. So it's very self-expressive. And I would advise people to do that and do a blog in an area that is maybe not in finance, but an area that they are curious about or interested in. And that will give them just the practice and the sort of the, the writing fitness, as it were, to be able to write a book if that's what you want. And I think you also have to know why you're writing the book. Is it just for pleasure? Is it to promote an idea or promote yourself? And to be quite honest about that. And then I think that the, in terms of broad careers, I mean, I think my advice to anyone is to, if you think you are interested in working in, let's say, finance, is to get a good education in that area, but also to just allow yourself to be led by your curiosity and not do anything because other people, be it your parents, your friends or colleagues, want you to do it. Because I think most people eventually in life, they find themselves in areas that they enjoy and that they're curious about. So my kind of philosophy is to be led a bit more by the heart than the head. I love the advice. Thank you so much. To wrap up, do you have any last words you want to get out to our audience? And how can people find you, maybe keep in touch, read more? Oh, sure. So I have, I'm obviously on Twitter, you know, at Leveling Book. I have this blog, and uh, it's just called The Leveling Blog, where I write about sort of the cross section of economics, history, politics. And it comes out every Sunday morning, not because I'm necessarily religious, but it's the one time of week that people have a chance to sit down and give three or four minutes to read something. So the aim is not just to write something interesting, but also to send it out at a time when people are maybe receptive to that. Perfect. Yeah, we'll definitely link to what you mentioned in the show notes. I can everybody just recommend to read your book. I found it very interesting with many very interesting frameworks, ideas and insights into how global markets work. And with that, Mike, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure okay. talking to you. Andreas, thanks very much. It was a great pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for listening to the Wall Street Lab podcast. For the show notes and much more, visit us at www.thewallstreetlab.com. To see what we're up to before anyone else, subscribe to our newsletter on our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast constitutes the opinions of individuals and should not 
be treated as investment, tax, financial or legal advice. We take no responsibility for the accuracy of any statements made in this podcast. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only, and it does not contain an offer to sell or buy any sort of financial products and should not be treated as advertisement for such. Any copying, distribution or reproduction of this podcast without the prior permission of the creators of the podcast is strictly prohibited.